welcome to episode seven of the UK Sailmakers Lessons Learned podcast series, where we interview incredible sailors who share their stories and tips to help you sail with confidence. I'm your host, Heather Mahadi, General Manager at UK Sailmakers International. Today, I'm joined by Justin and Christina Wolf, a pair of incredible double-handed offshore sailors who race primarily in the Pacific Northwest and Europe. Let's jump right into it. I'm from the Pacific Northwest as well on Vancouver Island. So I've been following along on your campaign out this way for a few years now. I'm curious to know, how long have you been sailing together? We have been sailing together for 28 years next month. Nearly three decades. Wow. Okay. So when did you decide to make the jump into double-handed racing? What was your driving motivation there? Yeah. So we actually met to do a double-handed race. So 28 years ago, I had just bought a 1984 Sonoma 30 and I bought it because I wanted to race it to Hawaii. And the idea of trying to find a full crew for that sort of thing didn't, didn't even seem reasonable. And they also, there were some double-handed races taking place in Seattle. They were called Jack and Jill races and Chris was the best Jill around. So (laughs) we started sailing together to do those double-handed races. When we met, I was racing for the University of Washington collegiate team on FJs and 420s. And so coming from the dinghy background, it was just a a natural way to sail. And um, we've just always had a good time sailing together. Totally hear you there. I also grew up sailing dinghies and I raced for UVic in FJs, same Mm -hmm. sort of thing, plenty of races at UW. So you guys started with the Sonoma 30 um, and now you have Raku, the J111, as well as I believe a Sunfast 3300 Red Ruby. Uh, What other boats have you guys owned previous to those two? We had a couple of cruising boats and then in 2011, we bought a J120. We really got back into racing with that and we raced that to Hawaii in 2014. And then we had a Schumacher 28 that we bought in 2014. It was a really fun boat. We raced that to Hawaii in 2016, sold that boat, sold the J120 and bought the J111. We also have a J70 that um, we race on Orcas Island where we've got um, almost 10 others. Wow, that's a good one design fleet for Orcas Island. I've heard that's a pretty active racing scene over there. There's quite a few Martin 242s as well. Yep. Fleet of those there. We have both, yeah. That's great. It's so nice to have some one design sailing. I'm sure it harkens back a bit to the FJ days as well for you. That's such a hard thing to get out of as a dinghy sailor is the one design racing is such a thrill. Right. It's actually been really important, I think, doing the J70 sailing to get the tactics and boat speed and you know, boat on boat racing that we wouldn't get from the distance racing that we do. And I think it's really helped us a lot. Um, so what made you switch from the J120 to the J111? What was, what were the deciding factors there? Yeah, the funny, that's a funny one because later this week is like the real tell of why we did it. We did Van Isle 360 in 2019 and we did it fully crewed and it was super fun but there was a few of the legs where we literally tacked 50 times with a Genoa. And we had in mind that that would be a fun race to do double-handed, but there was no way we were going to do it on a J120 double-handed and have to tack 50 times per leg. So we started looking for a boat with a non-overlapping head sail. And I will say that 65 Red Roses is a very well-sailed 111, and we saw a lot of them yeah, in Van, in Isle. Van yeah. Isle. So it was it was a fun boat to watch. Mm-hmm. So did you have to make any other changes to the J111 to optimize it for double-handed racing? Because I know there's other similar boats like the J99 that perhaps might be the more obvious choice for a double-handed. Right. What kind of changes did you do to the J111 to make it better for you too? Well, one of the big changes we made that is different than all of the other 111s is we have hanked on sails. And that makes a big difference for just being able to blow a halyard and get a sail down. It's not super for for peeling necessarily head sails, but we've made some other other plans for that where we we have a little bit more of a simplified inventory and um, our heavier jib is actually a, a reef reefable three, four. I've seen that a few times. I've seen it with the zipper. Yeah, we have the zipper. 
Cool. Yep. That's a that's a brand new sale for us, so it hasn't go, it hasn't been put up yet. Well, that's exciting. We'll probably get a chance at some point on the van now, maybe an outside leg, maybe. break it in. <laughs> Fun. Okay. I don't think we've actually made a lot of changes to the 111. Um, and part of that, I think, is intentional. Is we we sailed the boat it's pretty similar to you how you would sail it fully crewed. We don't really want to make concessions and say, oh, because we're double-handed, we're going to do it differently if if that isn't just as fast. So we would rather just, we'll just put in more effort and not compromise. Like I've noticed in a lot of races that sometimes there'll be a separate scored division for double-handed boats, but usually they'll still be started with the regular div splits. Yeah. Are you finding that's more and more common? That's my preference is actually to be racing against all of the boats that are in our, um, our rating band. Love the fact that there's many more double-handed sailors out there, but it's also fun just to, to race with the overall as well. In the U.S. or in the Pacific Northwest, where there's actually not that many double-handed boats most of the time, we're happy to go up against the fully crewed boats. But when we go to Europe, there were, they just had a race this weekend that had 48 double-handed boats out of 190 and so you really are just racing against the other double-handers, even if there's more boats on the course. It's kind of like a best of both worlds scenario to still start yeah, with your rating band, is. but get scored with the rating band and scored separately double-handed mm -hmm. and get the full picture in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You mentioned briefly about racing in Europe. What triggered that jump to racing double-handed in Europe? Tell me a bit about how you got involved with Red Ruby and the co-owners. In 2021, we were selected by the U.S. to represent um, in the the mixed doubles world championship in Italy, and we we did that race on Figaro threes, and worked with um, Jonathan McKee, who is a very well known, you know, former Olympian, an amazing sailor. What a lot of people don't know about him is that he has done a lot of shorthanded sailing. And so we worked with him a bit during that time in Italy. And several months later, we started talking about, um, you know, what we might want to do going forward. And the idea that there are so many races over in Europe, but the number of shorthanded you know, sailboat events and, and big events, they're all bucket list races. We started exploring options. Buying a boat over there that re realistically we would only use four or five times a year, that didn't sound reasonable. So doing a partnership sounded more palatable. Everything cost half as much. Yeah. <laughs> boat gets used twice as much. Um, and so that's, we ended up with that situation where we partnered with Jonathan to buy Red Ruby so that we both teams could go do these you know, essentially bucket list races, Fastnet, Middle Sea Race, um, Cap Martinique is a race across the Atlantic. There's quite a long list of races to do there with very big double-handed turnouts. So, so we went and did it. Cool. Do you ever sail with all four of you together? Like even just for fun? Yeah. For practice, we've gone yeah. twice. We've gone to the UK and sailed on the boat for a couple of days, the four of us, but we've never raced together. I will say that that, um, that partnership has really afforded us the opportunity to accelerate the learning curve for yeah. what do you do on that boat? Um, we all bring something different to the sailing and the opportunities we've had both on the water, off the water, and then with race debriefs, it feels like we have a much bigger team than just the the two of us. Yeah, we really have a four person team to make the boat go fast. And we're sharing everything we learn with Jonathan and Alyosha. And when they go over there and race, we do the same. And that's, I think that really is making a big difference. How do you find the racing scenes differ in Europe and the Pacific Northwest? You touched on it a bit that it's much more popular in Europe. I think it's the the number of double-handed boats and the size of the boats. So when we go to Europe, most of the boats that we're racing against are between 30 and 40 feet long. Um, and over here, when we race, the range was 
a folk boat to a Santa Cruz 52. In the UK, we're doing Fastnet in two months. There's 20 SunFast 3300s signed up. Our division is 95 boats. Another thing I was curious about is safety at sea. So, of course, double-handed safety at sea is a different story than fully crewed. Um, what special training or accommodations have you guys made for incidents like handling a crew overboard, medical emergencies, rig failure, things like that while offshore? In terms of things like man overboard um, on our boat, there's no dropping the spinnaker gracefully. It's full stop. And your only focus is really on making sure that you, you get to that man overboard button, that man overboard who's, you know, in the water. And I think that because of the interest in double-handed sailing, um, we're likely to see more discussion at safety at sea weekends. And I think that's, that's so important. One of the things we've thought about, and it's probably on most people's minds and even fully crude is what do you do if somebody goes overboard, if you have a spinnaker up and you're ripping and our, our discussion is, is you blow everything, how your tack sheets, no knots, just get rid of it so that you can immediately turn around. I think commonplace, and it's maybe even getting to be required with a lot of the races, is that your PFD now has an AIS PLB in it, having something that you can immediately track back to. So aside from emergency scenarios, how do you handle more mundane situations like things like navigation, tactics, cooking? How do you decide who does what, when? Uh, do you use a lot of autopilot to relieve yourselves? What is your general plan for that when you're offshore? I think it depends on the race. Um, so last year when we sailed to Hawaii, um, it it was pretty straightforward. Somebody was uh, always actively sailing the boat, but um, Pacific Cup allows the use of autopilots. And so in conditions where we could, we did use the, the autopilot. And um, the tactic for that race was not to get tired too soon. Races like Van Isle, um, we will not be allowed to use autopilot. So we'll be using things like the wheel brake if the helm needs to go forward to drop a halyard or something like that. We don't typically use our autopilot much for the mm -hmm. shorter races. You know, even at overnight, we wouldn't use it. Mm -hmm. um, it's multi-day, we would start to use the autopilot. And it's really just to help with um, energy management. Whoever's off watch is down, you know, we essentially boil water for, for freeze-dried, for coffee, for tea. That's, that's cooking on our boat. Um, and the navigation um, time, it's whoever's off watch is, is working on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe one person goes and does an investigation looking at the weather and looking at AIS of other boats and that sort of thing, but then it becomes a discussion. It's part of the fun of double handing is it's an equal share. Yeah. You don't get any opportunity for too many cooks in the kitchen. There's just the two of you. Other than fatigue, what are some differences that you find racing double-handed versus fully crewed? Um, so upwind. On the 111, we cross sheet the head sail. And so that allows all two of us to be on the windward side of the boat. Whoever's helming is just really actively driving the conditions. In a breeze on situation, using the high and slow mode is definitely a tool in the toolbox. Because we don't have weight on the, the rail, we're going to lose height. Yeah, this it's a, almost a funny question because mm -hmm. we don't we don't sail fully crewed to know how they do it. Yeah. It's kind of a big mystery box to us. Like what, what do all those people do? Um, I guess they stay busy, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I said that one time, I, I think I offended somebody. We don't approach it so differently. I mean, we're just trying to make the boat go fast and not in a double handed way, but just in a way that sailors make boats go fast we're pretty boring and repeatable. Like we know exactly who's doing what at a mark grounding. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things where 
we've done it so many times together or or swapped um that it's it's pretty comfortable um and then we're just able to sort of maximize on opportunities that come at the more challenging parts of the race like at mark roundings and playing the chess game and trying to set up for what's going to happen two moves beyond that. I mean, that's probably an advantage over a lot of fully crewed boats who don't have consistent crew. One of the hardest things with a fully crewed boat is you have a lot of crew turnover. Or, you know, some people can't make certain races. And then you do have incidences like mark groundings where everyone on board could be quite a competent sailor. But if you haven't done a mark rounding all together before, things can get jumbled. To the extent that it's a an issue on fully crewed boats. We don't have the too many cooks in the kitchen problem on uh, making decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's only two of us and we've been sailing together for a long time. So do we need to put in a reef? It's a very simple decision. We can make decisions really, really quick. You mentioned that you had done pack cup. Have you done other Hawaii races? No, we've just done pack up three times. Three times. On the J120, the Schumacher 28, that was 2014 and 2016. And then we took a break from racing to Hawaii. We felt like we actually wanted to just get better. So then we did it last year on the J111. And that was, I mean, it was remarkably different experience. Are you planning on doing another one in the future? Or what's another big milestone race that you have coming up? Well, I think the the big milestones go goes to Europe now because we're going to do Fastnet at the end of July, and then Middle Sea Race in October, and then Cap Martinique next spring. It's thirty three hundred miles, so it's fifty percent longer than a Hawaii race. And right now there are eighty double and single handed boats signed up with a super narrow range. Eighty. There, there's actually limits on the boat: thirty to forty feet and a rating band where our J111 is too fast and a J99 is probably close to the lower limit. That's the whole range. And there's going to be, I think about 50 of them are double-handed and 30 single-handed, but that there's never been anything like that anywhere ever. This is only the second running of this race and it, they've doubled the participation, but to have that many similar boats going uh, on that kind of a long race. I mean, that's that's like the entire hot cup, all shorthanded and all in similar boats. It's just wild. That sounds like it's going to be incredible. I can't wait to hear how that goes for you guys. I'm sure it's going to be an amazing experience. And Fastnet is also um, quite a different race this year. There's over 100 double-handed boats. Shifting gears a little bit, over the past few years, I've worked on a bunch of the sails that came through the Pacific Northwest <laughs> loft for Raku, <laughs> your J111. Um, what sails do you have in your inventory currently and which ones are your most used? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to answer it slightly differently. So the new sail is the J34. The, the J4 is often required as a heavy weather jib for these distance races but it hardly ever gets used. So rather than carrying around two sails, we've combined it into one. And so we've just saved you know, 40 pounds of sail that we probably, you know, it's just not gonna get used that much. And uh, I, I will add the new sail um, was designed for our Hanked on configuration, whereas our previous sail had been modified because when we bought the boat, it had a luff of foil. The other new sale that I think is actually going to be one we're going to use a tremendous amount is the A15. We love it. It's going to change the way we we think about our other spinnakers because it's going to get so much use. Mm -hmm. It is a fantastic weapon. There's been a huge rise in the A15 lately. I've noticed in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, yeah. It's just like the perfect combination, especially for distance racing, where you're never really on a true windward leeward. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just great sale. Yeah. yeah, and we we've learned that in Europe as well, having an A15 when other boats didn't, and it's just a tremendous difference. So another sale we have, we worked with Stuart a lot to get it just right is our code zero. Stuart went sailing with us to get an f- idea of just how tender our boat really is. Because if we had 
not done that and gotten a bigger code zero, the boat would just lay over on the side and we'd hardly ever be able to use it. So we have quite a bit smaller sail than the other J111s. And it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's easier to handle. It's more versatile. It's really great. So yeah. we're really happy with that. We also love the spinnaker staysail. We used it the whole time um, headed to Hawaii. Well, it's more popular in Europe. We have a spinnaker staysail and a Genoa staysail. And people think, oh, double-handed boats. It's like, no, we'll put up as many sails as we can put up if it's the right sail. More sails, more strings to pull. I'm glad to hear that you guys are really happy with your sail inventory. How does it compare to what you have on the Sunfast? Do you have a similar selection of sails over there? You mentioned you have the 1.5 for that boat as well. Yeah, the jibs are the same. We have a refillable 3.4 as well. We have that Genoa staysail, which is pretty fun. Um, we actually have a fractional code zero and a masthead code zero. Oh. Um, and then... And then we have our new sale that nobody else has yet, we don't think. And that's an asymmetrical on a pole. The pole is at lifeline level. So it's it's a very long left asymmetrical that you can pull back, pull back. Um, and that's uh, that makes it more exciting because there's a little more to do to jibe. Some of that is lessons learned from Pat Cup. And just wanting to be able to pull back a little bit to go down the waves better. Yeah. So right for these long races, um, they could potentially pay. For the 111, though, the kite inventory we have, um, I think we have a few more tools to to choose from. And they've all you know, got their purpose. We have a, a pretty large A2 that um, has been great. The Sailor Sea, as you know, is somewhat of a light air venue and so actually making sure that we can put up enough sail area to mm -hmm. uh to take advantage of the wind that we we typically get here we had a an a25 built for hawaii that's actually a, a really great kite that we may see some use on for for van isle mm -hmm. um potentially outside and then we've got the a15 some older a2s yeah, and an uh, A3. Yeah, sometimes it's good to have a backup, especially on something like, like Van Isle. Do you have a road crew coming with you? or We have friends. Yeah, we have <laughs> friends that are doing Van Isle with a van. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Perfect. <laughs> we just loaded We just loaded the van, actually, our part, of course, in just a little corner. We're really sensitive to not, you know, not taking over their van, but we have a few spares, a few spare sails and things like that. Doing it double-handed, we're obviously trying to keep the boat very light. Yeah, we don't want to carry that stuff around if we don't have to. Which is interesting. We should talk about the the rating for that. One of the really cool things about Van Isle that I don't think has happened yet in the Northwest is it's an ORC race, and we have an ORC double handed rating. It makes a big difference. We're obviously slower upwind in breeze, but we're faster downwind, and in light air upwind we're similar. And with ORC, we have a rating for each of those types of wind and direction. And so when we do Van Isle, it's going to be really fascinating. And I think that's the first time that's been employed in the Northwest. It has been so much fun to work with Stu and Joy at the UK Loft in Sydney. It's been such an amazing experience because of the analysis um, that, that Stu's really brought um, to helping us think about how, how we want to race the boat. And it's been working. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you on the race course next week for the Van Al 360. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. It's always fun to talk about double-handed sailing. You can find more episodes of our Lessons Learned podcast series in the how-to section of the UK Sailmakers website at www.uksailmakers.com. Episodes are also streaming on our YouTube channel, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. For UK Sailmakers, I'm Heather Mahadi. Sail with confidence.